Hello, nice to meet everyone here. I'll uh, get going as soon as I can because we've got quite a small amount of time to go for here. Okay, so what we're actually going to cover today. So um, I thought initially when I was going to look at this is to say, well, what would you most like to know about LLD? Um, there are probably some people, some people in the room here that have got architectures that aren't an LLD or aren't well supported by LLD and thinking, well, I've put some support in bin utils. Well, how much work would it be to put something in LLD? And it just seemed like, seeing as I've just gone through some of the process with putting ARM support into LLD, that I could perhaps talk a little bit about my experience with that, a little bit about what I'd learned LLD structure and what the sort of, say, pitfalls that you might um, run into when you when you go go and do sort of implementation yourself. So I will make a quick apologies uh, for some of the assumptions that I've had to make. Um, ideally, I'd, with, in a long talk, you could build everything up from the scratch, scratch, looking starting at all the basic linker terminology so that everyone knows exactly what, what I'm meaning. Unfortunately, I haven't got a lot of time, so I'm going to have to make the assumption that people know a little bit about ELF jargon here. Um, so um, what I suspect is if I, if I kind of just assume everyone knows section symbols and relocations, um, and hopefully if you've got that far, you should be able to follow everything that I say. Um, if everything is just going completely um, completely by, just you know, put your hand up and I'll see if I can explain anything. And if you want to ask me anything afterwards, I'll be happy to explain everything. Um, uh, another further disclaimer, I'm, um, LLD is actually more like three linkers in one. There's an, an ELF linker, a COF linker, and a MACO linker, and they're not I, they don't use the same code base, um, although they do ch share some design principles. So I'm going to concentrate just on the ELF one here, on the assumption that that most of you in the open source area will be using ELF and not COF. And also, I only know ELF, so um, that, that's perhaps my rather selfish bit there. Okay. So first thing I'd like to just start with, what um, a sort of general linker design constraints. Obviously, a... Um, um, there are more than one. There's more than one way you can implement a linker, um, but the sort of properties of what a linker does generally, for, uh, generally, if not forcing you, generally encourages you down a certain design route. Um, so mainly, what is a link? What is it that linkers does? It, you know, you're putting some input objects on the command line. These define some symbols. They reference some symbols. A linker's job, first of all, is to go and work out what do I need to link. So it would be going into the libraries, working out what it needs to, to sort of pull in working out what dynamic libraries you put on and what sort of extra bits it will need to generate. So for example, to, for dynamic libraries, it might need to generate some extra um, extra bits of code like the PLT and the GOT for the dynamic linker to handle. And once it's kind of laid all of this bit out, it can then go through and read the actual contents from the um, object and copy them into the output file. So really a linker is kind of a slightly smarter version of CAT, um, hopefully done to be faster than, um, than, than cat would be at that point. Because in, in, in theory, you don't need to copy everything out of the input objects, just, just most of it. Um, and there's some optional stuff you can do at the, at the end. So I'm mostly gonna concentrate here on the, um, the mandatory things that you have to do rather than, the, um, rather than the optional things. Okay, so here's this sort of in a graphical form. Um, so as, as you can see, the link is sort of generally follows a, either a funnel or a pipeline sort of um, structure. So you start with lots of free floating stuff on the left. And as you kind of go through the pipeline, you're, gra you're gradually getting more and more specific. Um, and what I mean by specific is that compilers will talk in terms of symbols. It won't talk about real addresses. And at the end of the, end of the link, um, you tend to end up with real addresses such that the program can be run, or you can give the job to a dynamic linker to, um, to finish the job at um, load or run time. But for example, on a static linker um, that's running on an embedded system, you, you might have no dynamic libraries and all of the addresses might be fixed as such by the end of the link run. Okay, so away from generic linkers, that's just a bit of context so that I can get on to what LLD is. So um, I'm working again on the assumption that LLDs sort of popped up on the lists from time to time, um, but I'm imagining most of you are still using bin utils and gold in your sort of day-to-day work and probably haven't gone, gone, gone through and tried, tried out LLD. So, um, so LLD's kind of changed form quite significantly since um, 2015. So prior to 2015, there was what, what we call now the um, MACO um, atom-based linker. And this was um, started as a sort of, I think an attempt as a, a linker tool set. 
and the idea was was that instead of linking sections, you would link atoms, which I'm not entirely familiar with what, what an atom is, but it sort of tends to come from the Mako type tool set where you would have each atom represents one function. And the, the whole idea is that you could do linking at a finer granularity than sections. It's also, other goal was to be linked directly into the code base of the compiler. So you could have a sort of, um, have the compiler talk to the linker directly without having to invoke another process. So it was kind of, um, had some sort of grand goals for how it would change the, the view of linking. Um, um, as, it, as it happened, these goals tended to contrast with ELF and COF. Um, for example, ELF and COF, you can't split a section apart without breaking assumptions that a compiler has made. So typically what happens is that the ELF and COF um, ports of LLD had to put extra constraints in to say, don't put all of, you know, these are all atoms, but don't split them apart. And so it ended up with quite a lot of um, extra sort of um, extra code just to make anything work. So in 2015, um, ELF and COF, well, first of all, COF split off. And I think a few months later, an ELF port came through there. They have a similar design, um, but they don't share any code. So this is one of the key design choices that LLD made. In that if you contrast that with BFD, where you've kind of got one shared linker code base, and it kind of like calls out to a, a sort of the BFD library to handle a different object file format. LLD said, I think that's more trouble than it's worth. We're just gonna have one direct way of doing things for ELF and for COF. Um, at the current one, I think the, there's, a, there's definitely an emphasis on performance. I think that's mostly coming from the people who are driving the project. They want a really fast linker, so they, they're kind of um, driving it from that direction. So it's sort of architected to do as much as it can as late as possible and to do as m a minimum amount. Um, so, um, and it's kind of, um, that, that, that has some advantages and disadvantages. It is a fast linker, but it can make implementing things quite difficult at times. Um, and it has a similar interface to the platform linker that it's intending to replace. So the COF linker will look like the Microsoft linker, the ELF linker will look like GNU LD. Okay, so, so I can kind of get towards the sort of porting side of things. Uh, these are some of the sort of abstractions that you will see in um, LLD. So if you know ELF at all, you'll recognize some of these sort of concepts. Typically, a linker will be dealing with lots and lots of ELF components. So as you can imagine, the data structures in it are going to look somewhat like ELF components. Um, so you have an input file that kind of abstracts all your sort of different object um, archive shared library. Um, an input section is a section that you've read in from somewhere. Um, an output section is a section you're going to write somewhere. So typically, the output section is your output.txt file, and it's made up of lots and lots of lot, lots of input.txt files um, to sort of use something simply. Um, symbol and symbol body represent symbols, where symbol is kind of like your global symbol. Um, symbol body is kind of the actual details of a symbol. Um, so this sort of lets LLD say, okay, there might be a symbol body that's a reference in one object, a symbol definition that's a symbol body in another object, um, and the symbol will point to the symbol definition after it's seen both the reference and the definition. Um, I mentioned target info there because that's what you'll spend your initial time looking at because that's kind of where the customization points are. Okay, this is just a very quick sort of graphical description of what I've mentioned before. You have the input file class, defining symbol bodies and input sections. Um, the symbol um, at the top there is sort of points to the best symbol body for that particular global symbol. If you're interested, local symbols are just symbol bodies. It kind of goes back into the input file to go and find the, um, the local symbols. And the output section is kind of like the product of address layout. And um, that sort of aggregates the input section. Okay. The control flow of LLD. Um, this is kind of as a, as a sort of porter um, where you just want to get something up and running. You'll probably spend most of your time in the writer area. Um, the stuff for the front is pretty generic and common to all architectures. First thing it does, it's pretty much a pipeline that goes, starts at the top here and then kind of jumps down to um, the writer um, and it kind of calls out to the linker script area. So first thing it does, basically does the initial read of 
of, of what, what it needs to do from the command line. Then for each input file, it loads it via the symbol table because the symbol table is where the logic for go finding stuff in archives is. Um, and it sort of just builds up a sort of sea of input sections and um, symbols. Um, once it's read all the content in, it can do global optimizations like um, garbage collection. Um, and once it's kind of g finished with the various processing it's done, it will call a writer. Um, so um, everything is templated in LLD based on, you've got four different types. You've got little endian and big, big endian, 32 and 64 bit. So typically you, you will end up calling the writer that matches your target. So for the one that I've been working on has been ARM little endian. Yes, I know there's big endian ARMs, but that, there's a little bit of a complication with that. Which I, so I'm um, doing the, the easy one first. Okay, and as I mentioned there, writer, even though in some linkers the writer might be just a bit that writes the ELF file, it's actually fairly complicated in LLD because that's where quite a lot of the address layout and um, PLT and GOT generation gets done. Okay. So what might you want to, do, want to do if you're going to add a new architecture to LLD? So the first step I would say is you consult your ABI documentation. Um, so the ABI documentation is where um, it's going to tell you what sort of things you need in ELF. Now, LLD doesn't implement all of ELF. It implements what its targets need. Um, so quite often you'll get things in the specifications that someone's written because somebody might need them. Um, but if none of, your, none of your targets or programs will ever use them, you can't write a test for them if you can't get support in the assembler to actually generate the um, constructs. So they're just not implemented. But if your target is lucky enough to need one of those features, you'll have to implement it. Um, typically, in, in ELF, you have the generic bits that's common to all architectures. You have the platform-specific bits um, that um, you'll have to have to go through and implement. And typically, the most common part is the relocation directives. So these are what tell the linker how to fix up parts of your code. And they very often will be machine specific. So um, um, there'll be something like your branch instruction has an immediate field. So you'll have a relocation directive that says, take this immediate field and do something. And I've got a example with that later. Um, your PLT sequences, um, will definitely be target specific, and you, your thread local storage relaxations will often will also be target specific. Now, LLD, ha be well, because some of these um, operations like generate PLT sequences and relax thread local storage are general concepts. There's kind of like a framework in LLD to handle these, and you kind of have hooks and custom variables to make that portion of the job easier. Um, one thing that I would say that not all ABI features are created equal. You'll find that the majority of your programs will use a very small amount of your ABI, and you'll have a few outliers that will um, will will re rely on a few things. So if you want to just get something up and running fairly quickly, you can do that with actually quite a small amount of code. I think to get Hello World working took about 100 lines of code in LLD. Um, there's obviously a lot more work to be done from that. Okay. So this is the sort of code that you'd be doing if you're doing things common to all architectures. So there's a, a class called target info. This contains all of the relocation support. There's a, there, a set of constants and set of re, um, relocations that you identify. Um, for example, there's some common um, relocations that all um, system five elf will need, things like the copy relocation. So you'll notice there, there's a 386 copy, there's an ARM copy, there's a MIPS copy. These all do the same thing and they can be handled the same way. So all you need to do is tell OLD what your relocation code is and it will do the work for you. Um, they also contains the code sequences for PLTs. Now, you don't need to implement PLTs, but if you don't implement them, you'll be restricted to static linking. Um, and in many cases, static linking, particularly if you've got a complicated C library, requires more support than just implementing PLTs and using the dyna dynamic linker. So my advice would be to implement the PLT sequences early because then you can use the dynamic um, C library that some other linker with more facilities in has built for you uh, at that point. And of course, the best thing to do is look at other targeted info subclasses and say, ah, if my architecture's quite like ARM, maybe let's look at the ARM one for inspiration, that type of thing. 
So here's a, just a very quick spot. I won't go through, this is the, the details are mainly for if anyone wants to look at the slides later. Um, typically what you would do for a relocation is implement it with up to three functions. I say three, up, up to three, because if you've got a relay relocation type, your add in is encoded in the relocation rather than um, a rel relocation where your target, where your uh, add end is encoded in the instruction itself. But if you think of these as get implicit add end is extract my immediate field that I need to do something with, um, get rel expra is what do I do with that relocation? So LLD abstracts the relocation computation. So um, things like branch instructions are very similar calculation across all our architectures. So LLD has one um, relocation code, RPLTPC, um, which expands to get me the address and the PLT of the destination, um, add the add end, and then subtract the place to get a PC relative jump to it. Um, so um, RPLTPC is for when LLD will basically say, do I need a PLT entry for this symbol? If I don't, I'll relax it to an RPC, which is just a straight function call. So that's the sort of typical relocation code you would use for your branch and link instruction. Um, relocate one is how do you write the result back into your immediate field. Um, just to give you a very brief example, again, won't go through the details. Um, the ARM branch instruction, our ARM call code, um, it's S plus A minus P. You extract the immediate 24 field. You actually, in ARM, you have to shift left by two and when you get the result, you have to shift back again because um, the ARM instructions are all four bytes wide, so um, you can get an extra little bit of range by, you know, well, because you know the bottom two, two bits will always be zero, you can um, get a little bit of extra range that way. Um, so support that, that's the actual code extracted from the class. So if you add the switch case statement label, you're looking at about seven lines of code to implement a sort of simple relocation. PLT sequences, there are two functions, write PLT header, write PLT. First one is for lazy loading, second one is for your standard area. Now typically there'll be different calling conventions that you need to obey to write these. My advice is look at, look at other linkers, see what PLT sequences they use, um, and you can generally find by looking at the ABI documentation there might be some simple cases, and you can generally work these out from, from there. Again, won't go into the details. Um, okay. Thread local storage. So um, there are, this is quite a complicated topic that you could go on for easily half an hour to an hour on from. Uh, but if you want to support thread local storage, there's a general model um, that it, it, that in LLD and target info. Very much you need to identify what models your target supports, plug the various relocations in, and then do the relo relaxations. So at the, mo at the moment, um, the one that I got me confused the most was the TCB size. So there's di two different variants of TLS um, uh, that are described in um, Ulrich Draper's um, TLS sort of architecture. It all depends on where the thread control block is, and that decides which way your relocations go. Um, and um, you, uh, you tend to find that um, x86 and older architectures use variant two, newer architectures tend to use variant one. Best advice I could say is go look at your ABI documents, go look at the um, Draper TLS model, but that's just something was a little bit difficult to reverse engineer from the code when I sort of first, first saw it. Okay, so coming up to the end, I've only got a, couple, a few more slides here. Non-standard parts, um, I won't read these out, but these are sort of a, you'll find that the older your architecture and the closer it is to an embedded system, the quirkier it is. Um, and you'll tend to find that um, quirky bits are not implemented by other targets and sometimes get in the way of other targets. So if you end up um, in this situation, uh, re really it's about you know, choosing a priority list of what to implement and um, trying to implement it in such a way that you don't annoy the other maintainers that much. It's, it's the usual way of, of upstreaming stuff that isn't necessarily going to be that popular. Um, so just some things that I sort of saw around here. Beware of phase order problems. This is the, the typical uh, bugbear in linker development in that you need to wait until some information comes up. 
Um, for example, you might, you might need accurate addresses to do your um, particular transformation, but then it, it, during your particular transformation, you alter the addresses and you suddenly need to recalculate them, but there's no support for that yet implemented, so you end up ha having no good place to put a particular phase in the linker, so that's just something to be aware of. Um, if you can implement a simpler form, then right now, rather than implementing the full complexity, you might be able to get something bootstrapped and support at least a few people. Um, and I'd say especially, if don't expect the, any reviewer to be familiar with stuff that is um, target specific or quite rare. Um, so it does help if you're posting stuff up to review to give links to what other linkers have done on the platform, various ABI sort of um, documentation. Just make it easy for them to be able to pick up stuff that they might not have seen before. So, summary, um, COF and LLD implementations tend to be drop-in replacements. I'd say some architectures are closer to that goal than others. Think x86, um, both the 32 and 64-bit variants, AARC64 are quite close to that. Um, MIPS is also getting on. Um, for ARM, I've got a lot of work to do. Um, I can get simple things working, but I've still got a lot of sort of um, um, a lot of the sort of major bits, things like exceptions to to go. Um, and I'd say porting an, an architecture that's similar to an existing one will be fairly straightforward. If your architecture is very different, expect to have quite a bit of pain. Um, I would say uh, just because uh, you know it, it will take some time to go through. So some just some references if you wanted to go look them up, and there we have it. Okay, thank you very much for listening, everyone.